I'm going to provide a quick overview of Renewable Energy Day, what you can expect and what the agenda looks like for the day. I will also provide a quick overview of the 2023 Indiana General Assembly session. Um, it's, there's a lot going on, so I won't be able to be uh, super comprehensive, but hopefully uh, we give everybody a good sense of, of where things are and then we can dig a little deeper in the, the Q&A later. Um, after that, uh, I'll be joined by Reed Davis from the Indiana Conservative Alliance for Energy, or ICAE, and Saber Northam from Hollowell Consulting to uh, provide some tips for uh, meeting with your legislator and uh, also how to uh, talk about renewable energy issues with conservative legislators. And then finally, we'll get to uh, question and answer and open discussion. And we're trying to keep things to an hour tonight, but um, if folks are still on and really have uh, more burning questions that you wanna ask, we're happy to, to stay on a little bit longer and continue the discussion. Okay, let's jump right in and talk about Renewable Energy Day. First of all, I wanna give a, a hearty thank you to all of our sponsors for this year's event. Um, we couldn't do it without you. And uh, you know we have so many sponsors that it was uh, hard to make that slide. So, so thank you to everybody who's really making the day possible. Um, so this is the fifth annual Renewable Energy Day, which is uh, really exciting. We've been, we've been doing this for a few years now, both uh, in person when, when we've been able or remote when we weren't. Um, I'm really excited to, to be back with all of you at the Indiana State House uh, next Thursday, on January 26th. Um, so what you can expect, you can expect to connect with uh, renewable energy supporters uh, and enthusiasts from around the state, like all of you. Um, you hopefully will be able to meet with your legislators to advocate for a renewable energy future here in Indiana. And you'll also be able to hear from organizations like Solar United Neighbors, um, and, and many of our, our sponsor uh, partners um, and uh, companies who are working to build that future. Um, and so here's just a little bit more detail about what the actual agenda for the day looks like. For those of you who have attended Renewable Energy Day in the past, we're, at, we're building a little bit more structure and activity to hopefully uh, keep everybody engaged throughout the day. Um, but first and foremost, uh, the most important thing is that we will be um, hopefully helping to facilitate uh, legislator meetings um, throughout throughout the day. So um, you all hopefully have already uh, received, um, you know, a contact with some resources about how to um, uh, set up those meetings. And we'll talk more about that um, shortly. Um, but basically, we're, we hope to support as many people as possible to set up meetings with our legislators. If you aren't able to set up a meeting ahead of time, uh, we might be able to help you to, to send in notes to legislators and, and try to connect with as many people as possible while you're there at the event. Um, but the kind of structure of the day is that we're, we'll kick things off at 9 a.m. Um, with a prayer service and the beginning of the Renewable Energy Fair. So basically sponsors, um, including uh, companies and uh, nonprofits, will we'll have tables uh, to kind of talk about their organizations and, and businesses and what they do. Um, that'll be, this will all be happening on the second floor of the Indiana State House. Um, so we'll, we'll kick things off with a prayer service at 9 a.m. Um, at 9.30, we'll have an express grassroots uh, renewable energy training, um, primarily for folks who aren't able to tune in tonight or who feel like you want a little, little more of a tune-up, but we'll, we'll be trying to kind of condense some of this information and help people um, kind of get the juices flowing for how uh, you want to prepare to talk um, with legislators and staff um, during, during the day. Um, at 10.30, we will have an opportunity for sponsor organizations to kind of share their, uh, their priorities on, on the stage that we'll have at the event. So that'll be a good opportunity to hear from uh, various uh, sponsor organizations. Um, starting at 11 a.m., uh, we will have uh, lunch served. Um, and then at noon, we'll have a, a press conference and rally. Um, and that's kind of the, the main uh, you know, structured event of the day. Um, you'll get to hear from uh, a renewable energy, uh, a solar company, a, a school with solar. Um, you'll get to hear from some legislators. It should be a, a really good uh, day. And then after that, we'll try to get everybody together for a picture. And then, um, you know, we, we will stick around. We have the space until 3 p.m., uh, but hopefully folks who, who have later uh, uh, legislator meetings in the day, you know, you can wrap those up and, and then folks, um, you know, can, can go about the rest of your day. Um, so that is kind of a very quick uh, overview of Renewable Energy Day. Um, if you have uh, any questions, I'll, I'll refer you to the, uh, the main uh, event page, which uh, my colleague Dan can share in the chat. Um, 
And that should answer your questions. If you have any other questions, please feel free to send me an email, um, inteam at solarunitedneighbors.org, and, and we'll get back uh, to you as soon as we can. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, General Assembly session. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here, but I think it's important to start with just a general sense of the makeup of the legislature that we have here in Indiana. Um, so right now we have super majorities, uh, Republican super majorities in both houses. Here are um, some handy legislative maps to kind of uh, give you a visual sense of, of what that looks like. Um, so we have 70-30 uh, a Republican majority supermajority in the House and a 40-10 Republican supermajority in the Senate. Um, but not all legislators are created equal. So it is important to know uh, who, who holds uh, power in the General Assembly. So who does hold that power? So first of all, as I mentioned, there's this Republican supermajority. So in both houses, that means Republicans um, have, have more influence. Um, the committee chairs are also in incredibly important. They set the agenda for the committees, uh, what bills get heard, what bills don't. Uh, they have a lot of sway over uh, what amendments um, end up getting adopted and ultimately what bills pass through their committees, which is a necessary step uh, for a bill to become a law. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, other Republicans in leadership also have a lot of sway. So uh, leaders can help to set the agenda and, and help to uh, decide what, what moves forward and what doesn't. Um, so right now in the House, uh, the Speaker of the House is Todd Houston from House District 37 uh, uh, up in Fishers. Um, and the Democratic leader is Phil Giaquinta up in, up in Fort Wayne. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, and in the Senate, uh, we have uh, Roderick Gray is the President Pro, Temp, Pro Tempore uh, at Senate District 37. And Greg Taylor is the minority caucus leader in Senate District 33. So I'd like to show pictures here. If you, if you see these, these guys uh, while you're at the State House, uh, feel free to, to say hi and let them know that you support renewable energy. Um, but as we mentioned, uh, the committee chairs and committee members are really important for our top issues. So the most important uh, committees for our interests in the House are the House uh, is the House Utilities, Energy, and Telecommunications Committee. Um, so you'll see up here uh, on the screen the the members of of that committee, uh, Republicans in red and Democrats in blue. Um, if you see your House member um, on this list, know that they um, are responsible for the energy bills that will uh, come before the Indiana General Assembly. So that's that's a, a good thing if you're if your uh, House uh, representative is on this list. Um, I want to be sure to highlight um, Representative Ed Soliday. Uh, he is the chair of the, the House Utilities Committee. Um, his district is up in, uh, in Valparaiso um, and House District 4. He's been the, the chair for a long time, is the, probably the most powerful uh, member of the House of Representatives when it comes to um, renewable energy issues. In the Senate, the Senate Utilities Committee is, is kind of the counterpart um, and, and the most important utility, uh, or I'm sorry, committee for our purposes in the Senate. Um, once again, we have the Republicans listed in red and the Democrats listed in blue. Um, and again, if you see your Senator on this list, they are an important decision maker in the Indiana Senate when it comes to these energy issues. Um, Senator Eric Cook from Senate District 44 is the chair of the Senate Utilities Committee. Um, and so again, he holds a special sway over um, what comes uh, out of uh, the Senate Utilities Committee. So now that we kind of have uh, that established a little bit, we can talk about navigating the legislative process. So how does a bill become a law? Um, hopefully most folks are familiar with this, um, whether you've seen the, um, the cartoon about it or not, um, but basically, just to give a sense of the the process that that has to take place during the legislative session for a bill to become a law, first, a bill has to be introduced. So the deadline for bills to be introduced has already passed. Um, then that bill has to be assigned to a committee. Um, so the deadline for bills to be signed to committee is coming up uh, tomorrow, I believe. Um, so we we will see all the bills that are assigned to committee here in the in the coming days. 
Um, and so it has to go through a committee to get a hearing if it's going to advance. Um, so after a bill uh, gets a hearing and then advances out of that committee, um, the bill goes to the full body, whether it's the House or the Senate, um, to be to be read. There's an opportunity for amendments to be added, um, just like there is uh, a, an amendment uh, process in the committee level. There's an amendment process for the full body as well. And then if it if it makes it through that process, it can go up for a final vote. Um, so that all has to happen <laughs> in the first House, whether it's the House or the Senate. And then it has to do that whole same process again in the second house. So if it uh, is introduced in the Senate and passes out of the Senate, it has to go through that exact same process over in the house um, in the second half of the legislative session. Um, if there are uh, different versions of the bill that passes out of the, the house and Senate, say there are just you know, different amendments offered, um, those versions have to be reconciled. Um, and then after both houses agree on a final version of a bill, then the bill finally goes to the governor, where the governor can either sign it, veto it, or just sit on it until it goes into effect. So there's a many, many steps. Each of those steps along the way, uh, you know, adds a little complication, nuance. There are different players who have, have a say. So um, it is important to kind of understand this process. And each of those processes, each of those steps have certain deadlines that apply. Um, this is considered a, a long session. Uh, this is a budget year at the General Assembly. So that's taking up a lot of the oxygen. Um, and that means these deadlines are a little bit later in the year than in a short session, uh, but things still move fairly quickly. Um, so the kind of key deadlines I wanted to make sure to share with folks is that by basically uh, February 21st or February 23rd, depending on the house, that's the deadline for committees um, to hear and, and pass legislation um, if it's going to advance. So it has to advance out of committees by uh, late uh, the February 21st or 23rd. It has to pass out of the originating house by the end of February 27th or 28th, depending on the house. Then again, it has to go through that whole process again in the, in the second house. So there's a second deadline, April 11th to 13th is the deadline for bills to pass out of committee in the second house. And then April 17th and 18th is a deadline for final passage out of the second house. Um, and then the last day for adjournment is April 29th, though it's, it's more than likely that the session will adjourn at least a few days before then. So all of this, uh, the legislative session for this year is gonna be wrapped up uh, before the end of April. So there's a lot that has to happen between now and then. Um, and that's why it's good that we're getting in front of legislators um, early in the session. But also just an important reminder uh, about why it's so important to contact and, and be in touch with legislators outside of the General Assembly session, uh, because everything happens really fast during session. So getting face time with your legislators in your district um, when they're not in session is, is critical to being successful. Okay. I know that's a lot to digest, um, <laughs> but now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the bills that are on the table um, this year and um, issues that we care about uh, that unfortunately aren't um, up for any bills, or I'm sorry, issues that aren't represented by any bills right now, um, but are things that we still wanna communicate with legislators about um, during Renewable Energy Day, uh, while you're in your session, or I'm sorry, while you're, you're in your district, um, if you happen to be able to meet with your legislator, um, you know, these are things that are, are important. It's, it's a busy legislative session. As I mentioned, it's a budget season or a, a budget year. Um, so that's taking up a lot of air, but, but we can't uh, let our important renewable energy issues um, not, be, not be heard. Um, so here are the, the issues that we wanna fight for that unfortunately don't have specific uh, pieces of legislation uh, to get behind right now. So first and foremost, we wanna bring real uh, community-owned solar to Indiana. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with that topic, uh, community solar allows all um, Hoosiers to benefit from uh, distributed um, solar, local, local solar that uh, is generated in your community that you can receive bill credits um, uh, for, uh, for a portion of the energy that's produced, even if you don't have solar panels on, on your own home or business. Um, this is a, a policy that's enabled in uh, more uh, nearly two dozen uh, states, and we want to bring it here um, to Indiana as well. Um, if you're interested in learning more about community solar, we have uh, uh, many resources on the Solar United Neighbors uh, website. 
Um, second, we want to restore fair compensation for Indiana solar owners. Um, so as many of you may know, uh, last summer uh, was a, a critical deadline that basically ended the availability of what's called net metering uh, for uh, customers served by Indiana's five largest uh, investor-owned util utilities. Um, basically, uh, the replacement for net metering that has been uh, approved, uh, been, been uh, uh, implemented at all of those five investor-owned utilities, both lowers the compensation rate uh, for uh, solar energy that's produced and uh, shared with your neighbors on the grid, and also changes how that compensation is calculated. Um, the utilities call it instantaneous netting. Um, we say it really provides no netting at all. And it's a, a big policy shift from the traditional monthly billing cycle netting that determined uh, uh, solar compensation with net metering. Um, a series of uh, advocates um, and solar groups uh, and the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor challenged um, the uh, EDG with no netting uh, program uh, that Centerpoint had approved back uh, way back in 2021. Um, and that, that case uh, went all the way to the state Supreme Court. Um, unfortunately, just a few weeks ago, we got a negative uh, ruling from the, the Supreme Court that basically upholds the status quo um, for Centerpoint customers, um, which really sets a precedent for the rest of the state as well. Um, so there is still some, uh, you know, active uh, litigation in, in that case, the parties, including Solar United Neighbors, um, who uh, are, have intervened in that case are still kind of considering our legal options for what to do at the state Supreme Court and the four other utilities besides Centerpoint um, that no longer offer net metering uh, have separate pending um, uh, appeals uh, trying to re restore uh, traditional monthly billing cycle netting. Um, but basically, you know, we think our, our best option right now would be for the General Assembly to act and pass uh, legislation, pass a new law that clarifies that even with the lower uh, uh, bill credit for solar that is shared with uh, your neighbors on the grid, um, that the monthly, traditional monthly billing cycle netting period is, is what's appropriate um, to restore fair compensation for, for solar owners and make sure that uh, rooftop solar continues to be part of Indiana's energy future. Um, and third, uh, we wanna make sure that Indiana doesn't fall behind in this renewable energy transition that's, that's going on. So federal policy, uh, market innovation and customer demand are all pulling um, the state forward towards uh, especially more local uh, distributed renewable energy uh, generation resources, other energy resources like batteries, electric vehicles, um, energy efficiency, microgrids, all of those things are, are de in demand by customers, but Indiana's policy keeps pushing us in the wrong direction. And so we just really wanna make sure that Indiana's uh, legislators, the decision makers, policymakers, uh, know that all of us renewable energy supporters um, want to see uh, meaningful action that points Indiana in the right direction towards a real renewable energy future. And make sure that Indiana takes advantage of all of these different uh, currents of federal policy uh, uh, and market forces to make sure that Indiana doesn't fall behind. Um, so I will just say that uh, if you're interested in kind of learning more about how to talk about any of these issues, um, we have um, some messaging tips for you in the uh, Renewable Energy Day guide, um, which if it hasn't been shared already, I'll ask uh, my colleague Dan to, to share that in the chat. And I encourage everybody who's attending Renewable Energy Day um, and anybody who maybe can't come on the day itself, but still wants to contact your legislators about, about these important issues, take a look at that guide, um, see what uh, uh, you know, pieces of kind of messaging guidance uh, resonate with you and, and build your message um, around that. Um, I, I do see a question um, from Sheila. Um, we're gonna keep going because we have a packed agenda, but we will have time for question and answer at the end of the, the presentation. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of this uh, legislation. So again, there is, there's a lot going on. Most of these bills um, have really kind of just been published. So uh, I know I personally am still digesting them. I think many folks um, on, on the line are also still digesting. Um, but please, uh, I, I'm going to do my best to just kind of very quickly and briefly touch on these. Um, if folks uh, have questions to, that you want to see clarified, please ask them in the chat and, uh, and also raise your hand to ask them when we get to the Q&A portion. 
Um, and also, if anybody on this uh, on the call feels like you know the bill better than I do, and you want to clarify in the chat, please please feel free to do so. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple of the uh, energy related pieces of legislation that have been introduced in both the House and Senate. Um, this is another area where we do have some more information in the Renewable Energy uh, Day guide, including links to uh, the General Assembly website where you can read more about the legislation. Um, but here, again, is just kind of a quick overview of some of the kind of most important pieces of legislation that, that we're tracking this year. Okay, um, so first of all is uh, House Bill 1007. Um, so the title of this bill is Electric Utility Service. It is a, a sweeping bill that is a priority of the uh, Republican caucus in, in the House. Um, and it basically uh, picks up on many of the recommendations that came from the 21st Century Energy Policy Development Task Force um, that many of us have been uh, following and working on uh, for the past several years. Um, and I should also mention that all of these uh, bills are introduced and authored by uh, Representative Ed Soliday, who is the chair of the House um, Utilities Committee, as I mentioned earlier. So this bill does a lot. Um, and so I'm not gonna cover everything, but just kind of the highlights are that it um, basically it embeds the, the five pillars uh, that were recommended by the task force um, for Indiana's um, energy uh, policy. So it kind of creates what, what they're calling like a, an energy plan for the state. Um, and th those five, it, it embeds these five pillars into um, Indiana statute or requires the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission uh, to consider the pillars when making relevant decisions. And those pillars are reliability, affordability, resiliency, stability, and environmental sustainability. Uh, obviously, many of those pillars, I think, are, are things that you know, many of us would agree with, uh, but the devil is in the detail and how they are defined. And there are definitely some questionable um, definitions, uh, in my humble opinion, um, in, in that bill uh, for how you define those pillars. Um, so it also, it does some other things, including uh, it, uh, ordering uh, the, IUR, the IURC um, to study what's called performance-based rate making and other al alternative rate making methods, um, which, uh, you know, could be could be beneficial, uh, could be harmful. Again, depends depends on the details. Uh, but kind of in an interesting step, it, it it requests a study, but then also mandates the implementation of uh, of performance based rate making no later than uh, twenty twenty seven. So um, it seems like it's it's also kind of creating a new mandate uh, for changing the way rates are structured in Indiana. Um, and finally, it also reduces the amount of capacity that utilities uh, may purchase. On the open market. Um, so a lot to unpack there. It's a very important bill and again a, a top priority of the um, House Republican Caucus. Um, the second bill, and I'll be a little more uh, brief on these other bills because I know I think I'm, I'm running a little long right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the second bill is HB 1417 and this, this basically um, is in response to another uh, state Supreme Court case and um, in effect hands over a blank check to utilities um, to continue hiking rates uh, by, uh, by recovering costs um, in, uh, in, a different, uh, in a different manner. So it, it definitely is another bill that we think will drive uh, electric bills continuing to go up the way that several uh, recent other pieces of legislation and, and the or laws that have been passed in the, the past few years are also creating a situation where electric bills are going up, up and up for Hoosiers around the state. Um, third, I wanted to highlight uh, HB 1420, uh, which focuses on electric transmission facilities. Um, this is a critical piece of legislation because um, if we are going to bring um, all of the renewable energy that we need onto the grid in the coming years, we need uh, transmission facilities to, to bring that electricity from where it's generated um, to where it's going. Obviously, Solar United Neighbors, we fully support distributed generation as a key cornerstone of our future energy needs, but we also need that large scale um, utility renewables as well, and transmission is what gets that uh, those clean electrons from point A to point B. Um, and basically what HB 1420 does is, is uh, grants the incumbent utilities what's called right of first refusal um, on uh, transmission projects, which basically means a reduction in competition in the development of transmission projects, which uh, could potentially lead to increase, uh, increased costs um, for all of us. Um, 
And so finally, uh, I'll highlight HB 1421, um, which is generically titled Electric Generating Facilities. Um, so once again, I think you, you can probably sense a recurring theme here. Uh, this is another bill that um, is about expanding monopoly utility profits. Um, so the, the big takeaway here, um, this is a very complicated bill, and I, I would be lying to you if I said I fully understood it, <laughs> but the big takeaway here is that it, it seems to create a, a, or expand uh, what's called um, QIP or um, uh, cost while in, uh, while in uh, I'm sorry, what is uh, CWIP? <laughs> uh, basically, it allow, allows utilities to recover costs uh, while projects are still in development. So even before they're generating um, electricity and actually benefiting customers, um, the utilities are able to charge you for uh, development of, of facilities that may never actually um, uh, generate electricity for us. Um, so it basically is expanding uh, projects that are eligible to receive that, that uh, uh, increased cost recovery um, and um, also uh, changes um, some of the, the ways that the uh, IURC approves um, new projects. Um, and I guess one other thing that I wanna highlight from that bill because it's part of a, a kind of national trend is it does also um, expand the um, definition of clean energy resource um, to include uh, what's called quote unquote renewable um, natural gas. Um, so that's just another, uh, another piece of uh, what I would consider greenwashing um, that this bill accomplishes. Um, okay, finally, I, I will be quicker on the Senate side of things. Um, there are a couple bills that, that we're following. So uh, first is uh, SB9. Um, this is introduced by Senators Lysing and Glick. Um, and basically it's designed to, to make it harder to uh, retire um, coal and gas plants, um, though it is uh, fuel neutral um, in, in its language and would apply, uh, you know, kind of create new restrictions for retire retiring any generating facilities over 80 megawatts. Um, and basically says that the utility cannot retire something without commission approval if that retirement isn't in their uh, most recent integrated resource plan. Um, Senate Bill 33, uh, which was actually passed out of committee uh, earlier today, uh, basically uh, creates, uh, and it was amended in committee, um, but it basically uh, requests a study from the IURC and um, the Indiana uh, Department of Environmental Management uh, uh, focused on the decommissioning and disposal of both solar and now, as amended, um, wind uh, power uh, facilities or equipment um, and request that study be completed uh, later this year. Uh, Senate Bill 411. Um, is, oh, I'm sorry, I should say Senate Bill 33 was introduced or is, is authored by Senator Greg uh, Walker and Senator Eric Cook, who again is the, the Senate Utilities Chair. Um, Senate Bill 411 is also authored by uh, Senator Greg Walker and uh, is actually maybe a, a little uh, beacon of light in this list and that it's something that I, I think hopefully, uh, you know, kind of contingent on some of the details, uh, something that many of us I think could, could get behind. Um, basically, it, it would create a uh, what's called CPACE or Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy uh, program, which basically expands financing options for things like energy efficiency or solar for, uh, for commercial properties. Um, this is a, a, a program that has been successfully implemented in, in many states um, around the country and, and has been, uh, you know, there have been efforts to, to bring PACE programs to Indiana in the past. Um, and, but this is, uh, you know, a, a hopeful um, opportunity to try to bring it at uh, uh, bring pace financing to the commercial sector this year. Um, and finally, I wanted to highlight um, Senate Bill 335 um, that is introduced by Senator uh, Shelley Yoder, Senator Ron Alting, and Senator John Ford. Um, and this bill would, which is sponsored or you know really kind of thanks to the efforts of the the youth led confront the climate crisis group, um, that this bill would create a climate solutions task force. Um, and if you're you know, interested in that topic, the uh, Confront the Climate Crisis is, is holding their own uh, event at the State House uh, called Act Now on, on February 1st. Um, and you know, I would encourage folks to attend that rally as well. Uh, but basically uh, the task force, the Climate Solutions Task Force 
um, that would be created, uh, I think is worth highlighting because it, it um, includes specific uh, topic areas for um, encouraging and, and promoting uh, distributed uh, clean energy resources like, like wind, solar, um, and uh, you know, other important resources that we need for Indiana's uh, renewable energy future. Um, okay, that was a lot of information. <laughs> and I'm sure there are many questions. I see uh, that the chat has been fairly active. So sorry uh, that I had to rush through um, a lot of that. Um, but again, we'll have some time for Q&A. We can uh, stay on a little bit longer if folks uh, have additional questions after the top of the hour. Um, the last thing that I, I just wanted to, um, to highlight is, you know, there's all this legislation going on. The legislators are getting bombarded um, by uh, lobbyists, uh, by emails, by phone calls. And so I just wanted to, to kind of elevate, you know, why it's so important to come to something like Renewable Energy Day, to meet with your legislators in person, whether it's at Renewable Energy Day or at an event um, in, in your district um, when, they're, when they're not at the Capitol, um, is that, you know, the more, uh, uh, the more personal your contact with the legislator is, uh, the more memorable it will be. Um, and the more that they're hearing directly from you, their constituents, um, somebody who in theory can vote for or against them, um, the more impactful that messaging um, can be. So I'd like, I just wanted to end on this idea of the kind of grassroots lobbying pyramid here with kind of the base level being kind of click, clicktivism or max, mass online action, signing a petition, sending a, a generic mass email, which is important and a good thing to do, um, but is really kind of the least effective uh, way to, um, to communicate with your legislators about important issues. Um, those in-person meetings, face-to-face, uh, -face, building a relationship with your legislator is really the, the highest impact form of uh, grassroots lobbying that you can do. And hopefully you can join us uh, on Thursday, uh, January 26th at Renewable Energy Day and meet with your legislator and really um, help to advance our, our progress towards a renewable energy future um, for Indiana. Um, and with that, that slide is actually early. <laughs> We're not going to discussion. Um, with that, I will, I will turn it over to Reed and uh, Sabra, uh, who is labeled uh, Jen Wagner, I see. Um, on, on her Zoom, um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you two. I'll, I will stop sharing my screen. You guys can take over and uh, share your share your screen. Yeah, thank you, Zach. I will uh, bring this up here in my presentation. Cool. We can all see that, right? Yep. Awesome. So uh, yes, I believe Sabra is in here. Uh, she may be mislabeled, but I promise it is Sabra. I have communicated with her elsewhere and I know for a fact it's her. Uh, but I'll just give myself a quick, or I'll, I'll give a quick introduction of myself and then I'll let Sabra do the same just to start here. My name is Reed Davis. Like Zach said, I am the executive director of the Indiana Conservative Alliance for Energy. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. We advocate for an all of the above approach to energy um, and come at it from a conservative angle. We are, and I'll, and I'll get into a little bit more in the next slide, more about our uh, 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 organization, but I'll let Sabra introduce herself a little bit. Thank you. Yes, it's because I couldn't, I couldn't, I was trying to get on Google Me, and then I figured, I read texted me and said, oh, you have to register. And so I texted Jen and she sent me the link, but it was her link. So I am Sabra Northam. Not Jen Wagner, but I love Jen Wagner. She's lovely. So I'll be happy to be her, um, at least a name for this presentation. Um, I'm the vice president of Hollowell Consulting. Um, just really quickly, my background, um, I'm a lawyer and a lobbyist. This is my 15th legislative session. So I have um, my sort of background. I've worked in higher education. I've worked with um, elected prosecutors. I've worked at a large firm and now I'm working at Hollowell Consulting um, and I love it and have gotten um, to work with um, a lot of these folks on this call and you all. Um, so happy to be here and answer some questions and read if you want to talk a little bit more about your organization. And and by the way, I'll just sort of read um, the star of this presentation. <laughs> um, and so I'll just chime in with, you know, with thoughts and anecdotes and then um, I, I can't stay on after eight, but if there's questions um, before then, you know, happy to help with those as well. So thank you. 
Yeah, we're happy to take questions at the end too, if, if Zach's okay with that, but it just depends. Uh, I've, I've already seen some questions in the chat that I'm actually gonna answer in my presentation, so. So the Indiana Conservative Alliance for Energy, a little bit more about us. We are a chapter organization of, you see that image there on the left of the Conservative Energy Network. The Conservative Energy Network has is also a nonprofit, has chapters in I think 24 states now. Uh, so there are folks that do exactly what I do um, in Michigan, Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio, you name it. Basically, what we do is at the at the Indiana Conservative Alliance for Energy, we also have a flagship project called the Land and Liberty Coalition. At the ICAE level, we focus at the state house, playing offense and playing defense um, against bad renewable energy bills and playing offense for good renewable energy bills, just trying to get steel in the ground in Indiana, um, trying to diversify our electric grid um, and trying to really bring uh, renewable energy here uh, to Indiana. And then on the land and liberty side of things, we do the exact same thing, but on the local level um, in the uh, on the very grassroots angle. So we go to local county commissioner meetings, local county council meetings, area plan commission, board of zoning appears, all that's different stuff but just at the grassroots level, whereas ICAE is at the state level. So sort of a two-pronged attack. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about why is it important, why is it important to uh, know how to talk to conservatives or Republican legislators uh, specifically? Why am I here presenting this to you and telling you these things? Um, these two graphs illustrate it perfectly, but I'll also say just in general, north of 80% of all elected officials in Indiana are Republicans. So sort of the genesis of our organization were, was we are conservatives that care about climate and, can, and care about um, clean energy, renewable energy, and a diversified electric grid, and also private property rights of landowners. And we understood that if more than 80% of elected officials in Indiana are Republicans, then it's just facts that if anything is going to be done with re renewable energy in Indiana, Republicans are going to have to be involved, and that is really, really, it's really, really critical to target them and get to them because um, they are simply, uh, for better or for worse, depending on what side you're on, that's just the way the cookie crumbles right now. That's just what the numbers are. It may change in the future, but we want to have action now, right? So that's just the way it is. Um, just some basic numbers and polling that we have done um, to drive home and illustrate the fact that... Um, uh, conservatives do care about this. People like me, myself, there there are folks like me out there. Um, you can go ahead and read some of these, but I'll read along. 59% of Hoosiers and 84% of conservatives believe that market costs, market and costs should decide new energy development. And 73% of Hoosiers and 68% of conservatives are in favor of legislation that would prohibit HOA restrictions on solar panels, something that we see unfortunately too much. Uh, and then 84% of all Hoosiers and 67, 76% of conservatives support continuing to give consumers fair market value for their electricity they produce. So you can see that conservatives as a whole are tend to be on the right side of this. If you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, um, it's some of the legislators that get in the way. And that's where we come in to sort of try and educate. So there's a couple or a couple, three key messages here. Um, we want to drive home first that these are pragmatic solutions that work for everybody, um, specifically uh, diversifying the electric grid. That works for everybody, right? We have It brings down energy costs, and it also uh, secures our electric grid. We don't, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, uh, like we saw in Texas a couple of years ago, things like that. Um, secondly, really, really important. These, these next two are very, very important, very critical. Emphasize private property rights and energy choice. One of the most effective um, talking points when talking to a conservative or talking to Republican legislators when it comes to this issue is private property rights. Everybody can get behind the idea that the government should not be telling, should not be picking winners and losers, should not be telling our farmers, our landowners, our pro property rights or property owners what they should be doing with their land and what they shouldn't be doing with their land. If, if folks want to farm crops, they should be allowed to do so and the government should be allowed, should, shouldn't be get in the way of that. If, the, if folks want to farm the sun or the wind, 
they also, the government also should not get in the way of that. And so sort of a hands-off approach really, really drive that home because that is a uh, Republican uh, talking point that just rings clear as a bell. Um, And then thirdly, and this is equally important, is steer clear of climate and climate um, verbiage. And I'll tell you exactly why. Um, There's been study after study. I was just reading one last week. There's been study after study done on conservatives and climate and what happens when climate is brought up um, in this sort of forum with the Republican. Uh, It's not true for all Republicans, for example, not true for me, but a lot of Republicans, studies have shown that as soon as you bring up climate, Republicans tune out. And for better or for worse, I mean, that's just the fact and that's just the way it is. After you bring up climate, everything else that you say after that is in one year and out the other because the Republican Party, the status quo of the Republican Party right now, I'll tell you, there is an identity crisis with climate. There are swaths of our party that believe climate is real and it's man-made, man caused by man. There are swaths of our party that believe climate change is real, but it is not caused by humans. And there are swaths of our party that believe climate change is not real and and humans have, I mean, it's not real, so there's nobody causing it. Two, you know, thirds, There, you can split that into thirds. And so odds are, if you're talking to a Republican, those are thirds, you got a 66% chance that it's not going to be a good message to bring up. Um, So I think that's, that's really important. And, And I'm happy to answer questions. I know that that is shocking and probably not something that is, it's not a positive thing, but it is what it is, right? And I'm happy to answer questions at the end um, and pick your brain on it because, I mean, it's sad. It's a shame, but it is what it is. So I'm happy to answer questions at the end. This is really important too. How to contact your legislator, how to do this. I've, I saw a lot of um, discussion in the chat about this. So I'm just going to go ahead and bring this up and just show you how to do it. Before I do that, let me run through this. You're going to want to use the Find My Legislator app or tool on the Indiana General Assembly website. You can follow this link right here. It'll take you directly to it. That's just a shortened URL. Uh, But I'll show you how to do it in a second if you don't want to follow that link. Secondly, call them and you can go to their caucus page and get all of their information, including their legislative assistant information. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do right now. Also, email. I'll show you how to do that right now. Okay. Okay. I believe you should be able to see this. So you're going to go, I just went to, if you see up here in the top left, I just went to iga.in.gov. That's the main homepage for the Indiana General Assembly. Um, and then you go down here to find my legislator. You can also just Google this, but you just go down here in the middle of the page, find my legislator, click that. And then you just enter in. It's as simple as this. You enter in your address, all that stuff, you hit search, and boom, it brings up uh, your your legislator in this in the Senate in the House, and it'll also show you like here on the map which district you're in. That's District 42, yada yada yada. So that's how you do that. And then I, I can't remember if it has their contact information or not, but e- even if it doesn't, I can show you an even better way. Um, so just go up. So once you have your legislator, you can go up here to the top right, legislators. It says. And then just you know search for them or find them in this list. So I'll just click on one. When you go to their page, it says over here on the left, it says visit caucus caucus page, or you can send them an email email right from here or visit caucus page. Click on that. And then over here on the left, you have all of their contact information. So their address, if you want to mail them, snail mail, old-fashioned way. You have their uh, phone numbers, the senator's specific email goes directly to them legislative assistant, the legislative assistant's name and phone number and their email. And then also just for, you know, uh, for fun, you can see exactly when they were elected, their affiliation, which committees they're in, et cetera, et cetera. And you can sign up for, if you want to, you can sign up for like newsletters and stuff like that. But that's really important, uh, especially because we're talking about how to engage with our legislators. So I just wanted to go through that. Two other things I'll mention, social media. Um, more and more folks uh, pay attention to social media. So I don't want to say, I think, I think bombarding is the wrong uh, word. 
I've got some weird Zoom stuff happening on my screen. I don't know if you guys can see that, but that was weird. Um, anyway, social media is good. Like I said, Google is your best friend. Uh, just Google this stuff. I mean, Google, find my legislator in Vienna. It'll bring it up, all that stuff. Google the legislators and it'll bring up their social media pages and their caucus page, all of that different stuff. Uh, Google is your best friend. Um, this is also very important. And I think this is where Save Up will really, really have a lot of key takeaways for you all. Um, do's and don'ts, because I'm sure there's a lot of things that she can share in terms of what to do and what to, not to do. Be polite. Like I mentioned, even if you disagree with the legislature, if you're in a conversation with your legislator and you disagree with them on something or, or they say something that you disagree with, there are ways to push back that are appropriate and not. There are ways to push back that are a net positive and a net negative, right? So you want to be just courteous and you don't want to argue with them. You can politely push back. Um, a lot of the times you have to keep in mind, a lot of the times you're not going to change their mind right there, but you can politely push back, especially if the facts are on your side. But there are right the right ways to do that and there are wrong ways to do that. Um, so just be appropriate and don't get emotional or try not to, um, try to keep your cool. Tell your story, Authentic, authenticity matters. That's, uh, I'm sure Sabra will agree that is something that legislators really, really identify with when they have, when there's a story to tell. Um, not only is it a good, uh, it, it, it drives it home in their brain, right? If, if they can, put, especially if they're in front of you face-to-face, -face, if this is an issue that you care about and it, they can put a face to the issue, that drives it home in their brain so much more than a phone call um, and just hearing the voice. Especially, and, and they can't sort of, especially with an email too, they can just ignore you. They can't ignore you if you're face-to-face, -face, right? And you're telling that authentic story. It really drives home the point and it sort of puts that uh, ethos or, or, or the ethos in the issue, which really, really helps. Um, keep it concise, be specific. That also relates to the last one here, don't ramble. Um, you want to know what you're going to say before you go in. Um, really, really have it down. Practice. Practice. Doesn't, does not um, ever hurt anybody to practice. Like just write, write down what you want to say, right? Bring a notepad with you and have specific bullet points, stuff you want to get across. Don't make them long paragraphs, make them bullet points and just make sure you hit all of them. Easy as that. If you Similar, similarly, if you get pushback from the legislator and you don't know an answer to a question, it is always completely acceptable to say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. I'll follow up with you. It's so much better to say that than try to recall something in your memory that is vague and, and, and you don't, you're not hundred percent sure and, and say it and it'd be wrong. And the legislator, because you just lost all credibility, if that's the case, it's almost, it's air on the side of caution, always better to say, I don't know, I'll follow up, I'll look into it and get back to you rather than um, speaking out of turn or, or, or risk saying something that might not be 100% in fact that you uh, aren't sure on. Um, I think I hit all these already. Yeah, when disagree, this is important. When disagreeing, ask questions rather than debating. Uh, asking questions, it demonstrates your investment and commitment to the issue. That's a really good one. When you get pushback or you disagree with some, a, a legislator on an issue, um, try to figure out where they learn that information. Why do they believe that? Where did they learn that? Um, what's what's uh, you know behind that issue? What's informing that belief that they have? That's much more effective than saying you're wrong, right? Ask questions, get to the bottom of it. They might not have firm standing on there and that might, and you might pull the veil across their eyes of, oh, I really don't have, you know, the facts of this. I just have talking points that I heard on Fox News or something like that, whatever it is. And don't ever assume, don't assume that these legislators are experts on what you're talking about. Don't go in and start uh, listing off keywords and things. This is a very nuanced issue. We are, all of us here talking today are way more involved in this issue than 99% of Hoosiers, right? So don't go in and assuming that they know all the lingo, they know all the ins and outs of these issues. Really start from the beginning um, and, and really just try to explain it to them on in a layman's terms. Um, see what else we have. That's all I have. Sabre, do you have anything to add on this do's and don'ts? 
Yeah, that's and that that was great, Reed. Um, I mean, I agree hundred percent with everything you said there. What you know, one thing I was going to add is I always like to you know when you when you walk into the meeting, thank them for their time. Um, yeah. Thank them in the middle of talking. Thank them again at the end um, because you know everyone likes to feel appreciated. Um, but certainly when it's session and there's a million things going on, you'll you a lot of you have done this before, but you know, there's, their days get stacked up as do all of ours, but um, things are moving very quickly. It seems at least as far as meetings and hearings and things. So um, it, it always does, but it just feels a little um, intense at the moment. So, um, so thank them, you know, thank them again and again, again, don't be combative, ask questions if, um, you know, if there's some pushback there um, and no, you know, they're really excited to meet with you. I mean, um, you know, everyone can have a grumpy day and be busy and have lots going on. But the truth is, like someone expressed earlier, you know, I'm a lobbyist. So my profession is to go educate them and to um, to share information, to, you know, work on relationships. But they really want to hear from their constituents. So, you know, make sure they know where you're from, what you do, your background yeah. and your why of, of why um, these issues matter. So anyway, that's that's all. Great job, Reed. That is, yeah, I could not agree more with that. Those are two things I definitely should have put in here. Say thank you, say thank you right away, and then send a thank you note afterwards. Um, you know, that is, it's an old tradition, but it's it's super effective. Send a thank you note afterwards. It, again, drives home in their head who you are, your issue, um, and all that. And then, um, yeah, especially because I was an intern in the in the state house uh, for a session. I know how time uh, sensitive these things are. And I completely agree with what Sabra just said as well. If Sabra or I go in to meet with a legislator about an issue, that's obviously good. And, and it does move the needle. But if a constituent for that legislator goes in and meets with them about the issue, that's worth 10 Sabras and 10 reads, right? Because unless I'm meeting with my actual state senator, I'm not a constituent. I'm not a voting. Uh, I don't vote right for that legislator unless they're, they are my legislator. So you guys are worth much, much more if it is your specific legislator. They really, really do, as you know, as they should, listen to their constituency more than they will a lobbyist in a suit or a dress, right? So that's just the way it goes. Here's my contact information. Uh, if there's any questions, I don't know how we want to field that or anything, or I know I probably rambled and went long. I didn't follow my advice. I rambled, guys. Sorry. Um, but yes, Zach, I defer to your um, decision making. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, both Reed and, and Sabra. Um, I definitely want us to get to some questions, um, but really quickly first, I, I just wanted to note one other thing that Shannon mentioned in the chat, but I wanna make sure to say it out loud. Um, after your meeting, it's also really important, uh, in addition to, to thanking uh, the legislators, to try to capture uh, notes or as many takeaways as possible and share them share them with us so that we can try to get a sense of how your conversation uh, with the legislator went. <clears throat> and for those of you who will be there in person um, at Renewable Energy Day, we will have uh, you know, a, a piece of paper that you can handwrite uh, your notes on if that's something that you prefer. But in the Renewable Energy Day guide, there's actually also a link to a form that you can use uh, to just automatically share, um, share your, your feedback uh, from the meeting with, with the uh, organizers of Renewable Energy Day so that we can try to you know, put the pieces together, gain some insights from all of the meetings that you all are having, um, hopefully dozens of meetings, um, and, and try to see if there's any um, you know, opportunities that come, come from those meetings. So that, that report back form, uh, whether you complete it in person, handwritten, or online using the link that's in the Renewable Energy Day Guide is uh, really important. Um, okay, uh, so I think with, with that, uh, let's go ahead and get to some questions. Uh, Dan, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, there was a really interesting question in the chat that I was hoping that uh, Reed and Sabra might be able to respond to because talking about the why, why the why you're engaged is important, but for a lot of people, that reason to be engaged is climate, climate change, yeah. which Reed said to steer clear of. So I was hoping that maybe they could address that because I think that applies to a lot of folks. Yeah, that's a really, really, really good question. And it's something that I struggle with, for sure, um, when I am meeting with legislators. Um, I'm just thinking. 
you know, I think that, hmm, <laughs> that's I mean, good. That's go ahead. Yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump in a little bit. And I mean, you know, part of it is, um, and I, I don't mean this to sound, um, what's the word? Not condescending is not the right word, but it's like the, the, the terminology climate change is, is a terminology that is like a hot button issue with some very conservative legislators. Again, you know, some understand it and um, believe it's happening and some frankly don't. Um, and it's, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get much further, I think, talking about, um, you know, like, hey, why is um, one, I'm, I'm for renewable energy, I support renewable energy, um, because, you know, of all these different reasons ever, you know, think, think of sort of those um, principles that Reed touched on before, you know, personal property rights, I want to be able to build, you know, I want to be able to produce my own energy and use my own energy. Um, I mean, really, and it's, it's more focusing on, you know, like I want to have clean water. I want um, like talking about specific issues as opposed to because the climate we have climate change, right? More well, we need we need to make sure that yeah, it's important to have you know reliable, um, affordable energy. It's really important to have renewable energy as well. Um, so so really, I think you know as opposed to thinking in your mind of like I'm not going to talk about climate change. You can talk about it in a way that is more about supporting things as opposed to saying like we're destroying our planet or something like that. I mean, just the the magic words of climate change, you know, the to the extent you can steer clear of it and focus more in on actual policies. Um, I think I think that is yeah. more effective with some of our, especially some of our more conservative folks. Yeah, I have two things I'll say in, in reference to that. Energy security is good, by the way. Sorry, someone said energy <laughs> security. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good one too. Great way to, yeah. Great. Yeah. And, and two additional points on that. I would say that um, there are ways around it. One is I think you could lean on rather than climate change in that same venue or vein, you could lean on, hey, Republicans do have a long history of um, passing legislation that protects the climate and the environment. Richard Nixon uh, established the EPA, right? There's a long history of Republicans doing um, actions that benefit the environment, protect the environment, uh, establishing the national parks, things like that. The Republican, this is not something that Republican, the Republican Party has shied away from in the past, and it's something the Republican Party should um, support. That is a way of sort of, it sort of hits that um, environment, protecting the environment, and then the Republicans as well, there's a way around it. And then thirdly, or secondly, I'll say, what we just what I just went through with you is what we have found to be the most effective. We have not found in our personal experience climate to be effective. But if it is your why, and if it is why you're showing up, who am I to tell you to not tell your story? Um, you should do, you should follow, you know, if it is your message, it may what I'm telling you is it may not be effective, it may be a net negative. But if it's your story, it's your story, right? So um, I just leave you with that. If there's any other questions. I'll, I'll just chime in to say, I've been kind of looking at the chat um, and I did uh, want to elevate. Uh, Mary talked about uh, uh, my belief that it is a spiritual value um, to follow God's instruction, to be a good stewards of the earth. And that kind of creation care framing is going to be the subject of the, the prayer service that will kick off Renewable Energy Day. Um, so that is something that that will be kind of discussed um, during the day. Um, is if, if anybody else has a question, or yeah, go ahead, Shannon. Yeah. Zach, I just wanted to chime in. I know there's a few of you on this call that are actually going to be meeting with some of the Democratic senators and representatives. And I want you to feel like those meetings are important and effective for you as well. Um, because a lot of the messaging tonight has been around some of the conservatives in the state house and how they respond to energy issues. Um, if you're going to be meeting with one of our allies, um, I still want you to be able to talk to them because you're an important resource for them. A lot of them haven't heard about some of the recent news and developments in solar policy, like the decision on netting. So you can be the person who kind of explains that, that to them in the best way you can. 
Um, also asking them for uh, how you can support them and what they're hearing, because sometimes they provide really valuable insight and intelligence into what's happening in their committees and on the floor. So asking them what they've heard about certain bills or how you can help them be effective um, to getting things like they're through the committee process or stopping um, bad bills. Um, please just you know use them as a resource and then ultimately thank them for their work on these issues um, because they're the sometimes the people that are helping us um, in the back end of these you know issues every day. So I do want you to have those meetings and um, get a chance to talk to them and educate them and well, as well as having them educate you on what they're working on. Yeah, thank you for that important point, Shannon. Um, okay, so I, I want to take Sheila's question, but I do also want to note we're, we're five minutes past the top of the hour, so so sorry for, for running a little bit long. I want to take uh, Sheila's question, and I'm happy to stay on to take a few more questions, but I know if uh, Sabra or others, if you have to hop off, um, thank you so much for, for joining us, and thank you to everybody um, who, who attended. I hope this was helpful. We will definitely be sharing a, a recording. Um, and in addition to other follow up resources with everybody who RSVP'd both for the training and for Renewable Energy Day. So thank you all so much. But with that, uh, Sheila, please. Uh, yeah, uh, Justice 40. I mean, it's, I know we're in Indiana, but yeah. is Justice 40 anywhere on your radar? Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think Justice 40 is a great example of the kind of uh, uh, the kind of national tides that are pushing the us towards the renewable energy transition towards a more local distributed just uh, clean equitable and affordable energy system um, so so yes i think you know when i think about justice 40 you know i'm thinking about uh community solar um, i'm thinking about uh you know ways that that works you know potentially the, like commercial pace help, helping um you know schools and businesses uh, expand solar access uh, that could in include under-resourced communities as well because it's expanding financial opportunities. I think there's a lot more that we could be doing um, to increase um, you know, access options, um, both on the project uh, or renewable energy deployment side, and especially also on the, the economic development, uh, workforce training, the jobs side of things. Um, so those are, I think, all um, you know, on the table, but I, and I, you know, I really think that making sure Indiana doesn't miss on opportunities to take advantage of federal policies that will kind of, you know, uh, that are the embodiment of the Justice 40 goals, um, I think is, is a key part of that. I'm not sure if that directly answers your question. And if is it on else, your radar? I guess that's my, my only it, question. Are, are we not talking about that? I understand that this whole call tonight was a very conservative call in reference to what's out there right now. But my question is, should we not even speak on that? Thank you, sir. Oh, I mean, no, I, I don't think there's any reason to not to not talk about Justice 40. I think it's a-, it's a Okay, so I need you to talk about Justice 40. I need you to put that on your platform. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Are there any other any other questions? Is there some some relevance to the the uh, the uh, legislative federal acts that were passed last year that are trying to enable renewable energy implementation even in churches and other places and and the ways that the legislature can at least add credibility to that in a divided society so that so that we can make progress at um, providing facilities that have long life and that uh, are uh, compatible with creation care, et cetera. I just, I just wonder in a, in a diverse church, which most are, um, these kinds of things are controversial and, and, the, and the legislature has an opportunity to provide credibility to what's really useful um, in, in society. Yeah, there are a ton of, um, you know, historic, unprecedented words that get thrown a lot of, around a lot of federal funds coming for renewable energy specifically, um, as we know, many other great issues, but renewable energy specifically. And right now, the state legislature has not really has, has not really taken up any specific bills that address those funds, because mon much of them are either competitive grants that will be applied for by communities and organizations directly to federal agencies. Um, so that kind of bypasses the state legislature. Um, some of them will be coming in the form of block grants that will be dispersed by a couple of different state agencies 
mainly the Office of Energy Development. Um, and uh, some will be um, things like tax credits that will be available to residents and businesses. Now, the state legislature does and could potentially have an important role to play. So I think that sometimes raising this uh, opportunity to lawmakers uh, is good, but as Laura pointed out, it can be kind of divisive um, because they view it as like spending taxpayer money that they don't think should have been used uh, for this purpose. So you have to kind of use it with, um, I would say discretion, like kind of know how to frame it uh, if you're going to raise this as an issue. Um, but I think that also Indiana likes taking advantage of federal funds when they're available and then taking credit for the state doing good things. <laughs> so um, if you can carefully hint at that, that there are some opportunities to set Indiana on the right path to be more competitive in the Midwest, um, using some of these uh, uh, funds that are coming for smart energy development, I think maybe framing it that way could be beneficial. I would research your lawmaker and kind of see how maybe they've written something on the subject in the past. Um, but, you know, we all know how important this, these funds are, especially for things like environmental justice. Um, but that might may not be the most effective messaging in a 10 or five minute meeting. And so I'll just leave you leave you with that. Yeah, in our case, yeah. our church is, is planning a, a, re, a, a renewal of some of the church building and some expansion. And the challenge is, is to uh, work at uh, do, moving to heat pumps rather than gas. And those are technologies that are actually beneficial for the future. Um, and, um, and, yet, and yet they are divisive in many ways. And I think if there was any kind of uniformity, mess, any uniformity, any uniform messages coming from the legislature regarding these advanced technologies, it would help. Yeah, and I'll just add there is a section in kind of the messaging tips of the Renewable Energy Day Guide that kind of directly addresses um, some of the framing that that Shannon um, was just just suggesting. And, okay. and yeah, I you know I'm definitely hopeful that we can take advantage of the fact that a lot of those funds will actually be flowing through the state. Um, you know, so the you know Indiana legislators can be at a lot of ribbon cuttings, hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have time for yeah at least one more question. So uh, I see Apostle Dr. Julius Pressy. Good evening. Hello. I'm going to put my pitch up here so you see who I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shannon, I, I really appreciate uh, your conversation about the competitiveness. One of the things that, that uh, I'm concerned with about Indiana as I'm involved with the uh, Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition, which is which we are operating within eight uh, states within the Midwest, and uh, in several of our states, or one of our states in the uh, Illinois, for an example, Illinois competitively uh, passed the first major uh, climate and jobs bill uh, in Illinois, and they have put eighty million dollars a year towards creating new jobs and new opportunities in Illinois. My concern is when is Indiana and what can we do to push Indiana towards putting together a comprehensive program that will be felt throughout the state of Indiana uh, where we can go in and clean up the cold, the uh, cold ash situations up in our Northwest corner deal with some of the cities that are that are dealing with water pollution and and not having good water to drink and other things we we need to come up with some program to put indiana in a much more competitive uh, position in utilizing these funds that would be able to come in and help indiana to be seen as a state that is progressive in in uh, in one in our environment to be clean and healthy for all of its citizens. I think and that's a great question for your lawmaker: is what is Indiana doing to put us on a path to clean energy jobs um, in line with other states? You don't even necessarily have to mention Illinois. You can mm -hmm. just say like we all know that clean energy jobs are you know 
making uh, roads to the future for people. And we want to have those here in Indiana. What is our, what are, what are you guys doing to, you know, make that possible? So, and, and energy efficiency jobs, um, obviously, I know you spoke to some environmental justice work um, that also creates employment opportunities. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know you could speak to that knowledgeably. Uh, so if you want to talk about that, obviously, with your lawmaker, please do. But um, there are some great talking points additionally in the red guide on clean energy jobs and the potential for that. So, you know, please feel free to include those in your meeting as well. But that's a good question for, for your lawmaker. OK, thank you so much. Yeah, I think we can all agree that's definitely the direction we want to be heading. So, um, you know, we have a long way to go, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, working together is how we're going to get there.